Welcome back to our series on introductory statistics. I'm Mark Ledbetter, and this is lecture video 15. We're in chapter 4, part 2. So last time we talked about a scatter diagram, which is simply a plot of x and y. And we talked about fitting a line, the best fit line, through those points. And the, the line that kind of splits the points the best that they can. We talked about the correlation coefficient r, and we said that it's a number between negative 1 and positive 1. So if you calculate something that's negative 2 or negative 1.2, you're wrong. You made a mistake. If you if you calculate r and it comes out to positive one point something or two or something, you made a mistake. You need to go back and do it again. R doesn't have any units. That's why it's always between negative one and positive one. So it's a it's a measure of relative standing. Uh, relatively, how well does x associate with y? And it doesn't matter what units x are in or what units y are in. They're going to cancel out. So don't waste your time changing units. As r gets closer to 1, whether it's uh, the absolute value of r, as it gets closer to positive 1 or as it gets closer to negative 1, the amount of variation uh, between the points and the line, this line, the amount of vari variation around the line gets smaller as r gets closer to 1 or closer to negative 1. As r gets closer to 0, then the amount of variation around in, in the points from the line, it starts to increase. The closer r gets to 0, zero the more spread out things are uh, and the worse the association. If r is 0, uh, that means there's no linear association. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's no association at all. You could have a nice, perfect quadratic or parabola relationship, but the straight line will be plotted like that. So, today we're going to continue talking about correlation. So, the objectives for this se section, we're going to try to use today sample data to compute the correlation coefficient r. And we're going to start to understand the meaning of the correlation coefficient r. And we already did that a little bit last time. So... Let's look at this lovely, easy formula right for this. So before you get too freaked out, um, let's see what we have. And I forgot to put my uh, square root here and square root there. Okay. So um, r, we're going to take the distance r is from x, or x is from x bar for every point x, y. We're going to subtract the x from x bar, we're going to subtract the y from y bar, and we're going to multiply those together, and then we're going to add them up. So we're going to end up with like x1, y1, plus x2, y2, plus all the way up to xn, yn. That's what we're doing in the numerator, okay? But don't worry, we don't have to use this formula as it is up here, because it's even the calculator doesn't do that. And then we divide by the square root, and this number is our standard deviation of uh, x. And I see that I, um, I'm i pretty sure I left off um, n minus 1 up here. Okay. So, um, yeah. So we end up with, um, this is the standard deviation of x, and this is the same formula, standard deviation of y. So another way to write this is right here. Okay. So uh, then we can simplify this right here. So we have the sum of xy minus n times x bar times y bar over n minus 1 times the standard deviation of the x's times the standard deviation of the y's. So if you have the standard deviation, if you know the standard deviations, you can use this formula it's fine, and it's not too bad because you've got the, the averages and what have you, so the only thing that you really have to calculate is this x times y, okay? If you don't have anything but the data, then here's our computational formula. So rather than um, go over this too much, let's just uh, start trying to plug this in for the, our example from last time on those phosphorus levels, okay? So here we have n, and we have times the sum of x times y. And here we have the sum of x times the sum of y. 
and then here we have the numerator of the standard deviation. And here we have the numerator of the standard deviation, but now for the y's, okay? So let's see. So the first thing, whenever you do this, the first thing you need to do is write out your formula. I will take off points if you don't write out your formulas first because many mistakes are made by not writing out the formulas and then you try to do it and you don't have the formula and you mess up and you get a very wrong answer. Okay. So the first thing we do is we write X and Y here. The next thing, so I look at this formula and I see I need x times y. I need the sum of the x's. I need the sum of the y's. I have the sum of x squared, and I have the sum of y squared, and then this is still the sum of x and the sum of y. So I need xy, x squared, and y squared. Okay, So that's what I've put here. We need, we need these. We look at the formula and we determine what do we need to calculate. And don't calculate any more than you have to. So I've written down the x's here, whoops, here, and then I sum them up. We're going to total every one of these. And so this is the sum of x, and this number is the sum of y. And then I take each value of x and multiply it with y to get this number here. And I do that for every number, and there's no shortcut. You can't do it any other way. You can't take... You can't take 52 times 39.3. That does not give you 264. That gives you a much bigger number. 3 times 50 is um, 150. 5 times uh, nearly 40, that's another 200. So uh, it, it's, it's definitely a very different number. Okay? So you can't do that. There's no shortcut. I'm giving you the shortest way to do it. If there was a better way or easier way, I promise I would tell you. Okay. So... Now, we've taken x times y. Now we take the x values, and we square them to get this number. And we take the y value, and we square it to get this number. Now, I do by row first. So I did all the x times y's, and then I did all the x squares, and then I did all the y squares when I did this. And by the way, n is the number of pairs so I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. It's not 16, it's 8. We're talking about pairs of data, x, y coordinates. There, how many points will you plot? You're going to point 8. You're going to plot 8. That's what n is. So now let's plug into our formula here down here, the values. So here I have n, so 8 goes here. Then I have the sum of x times y. This is the sum of x times y. By the way, let's go ahead and identify the sum of x squared and the sum of y squared. Okay. So now I plug those into the formula. Sum of xy is 264.77. And then it says minus. And then I need the sum of x, which is 52.0. You don't have to put the zero there. I'm going to. And then the sum of y, 39.3. And on the bottom, I need, again, I need n, which is 8, and then the sum of x is squared, and the sum of x squared is 345.38. And then I need to subtract the sum of x, which is 52, squared. For the y's, I need to do the same thing. It's 8 times the sum of y squared. Here's the sum of y squared. 205, not a very pretty 5. 205.57 minus, then the sum of y, which is 39.3 quantity squared. I want to point out that you notice that I'm not squaring this number. That's not what the formula says. It says the sum of x squared, this is one number. So please don't square it again. That'll make you way off. So please don't do that. Okay. Now, it's best for you to take several steps and write it down so that you don't get lost. So the first thing I do is the numerator. It's pretty easy. 8 times 264.77 minus 52 times 39.3 in the calculator. Hit enter and then write it down. Now, I want to tell you that I then do what's under the first uh, square root sign. 
and I got 59.04. And then I do the second square root sign, and I get 100. Notice that these numbers will always be positive because they're the numerator for the standard deviation uh, or the variance, and they're always positive. They cannot be negative unless you make a mistake. Okay, just it can't be. So you're plugged in something wrong. If you, uh, it's not the formula. I promise you, you've plugged in something wrong. Usually you've left out the n, or you've reversed these, uh, something along those lines. Okay, so those will make it negative, so don't do that. I know, it's easy for me to say that. I know it now. Okay, so I get, so the next thing, that I have this note down here. Some of you may want to use this. If it's both under the square root and they're multiplied, you can multiply those and they go under one square root. That is permissible. It does work, okay? And so you could get this number and then have that and take the square root of it. And when I take the square root, I can't, I can't round. I have to write every single number. But I have a trick. I have on my calculator a button that does this. And so after I do the numerator, or the denominator here, it's in my calculator. I don't want to have to type it in again. So I then press this button. And then I multiply by the numerator. And it gives me this nice number here. And we round R, this is R, we round it to three decimal places unless they tell you to do otherwise, and I will not. So I'm going to tell you, round it to three decimal places. Okay. Now this seems pretty close to one, and it's positive. And so we say it, there's, a posi there's a possibility of a positive linear association. Now we have to perform a test before we can say for sure. Okay. It looks high. And the more, the bigger the sample size is, and the higher this number, or the closer it is to one or negative one, the more likely there is it's statistically significant. But we still need to perform the test so we don't make claims that uh, aren't true. So how do we test whether something is statistically significant? First thing you do is you compute R. You need that first, which we just went over. Then we're going to use the critical value table. Okay. And I'm going to uh, do that, look that up now. Okay, so now I'm, I have this table that's from the book. And here's the procedure that I'm going over. And here's the table. You'll notice that you have N here. And we have something called alpha equals 0.05 and alpha equals 0.09. And then we continue N here and alpha and alpha, the different levels of alpha. And so here's the table we're going to use. <clears throat> now, uh, so we'll come back here and look at this in just a minute while we're doing the test. So, <clears throat> so we're going to use that table. We're going to find the value of n under the column that we, was labeled n. Then we find the value beside it for the correct value of alpha, which has to be given in the problem, is either going to be alpha equals 0.05 or alpha equals 0.01. And the value you find uh, where these two intersect is called the critical value. Uh, so alpha is the risk of error that you are willing to take of mistakenly concluding that the population coefficient, um, coefficient um, or uh, actually the, the population cor correlation coefficient uh, rho is not equal to zero when in fact it is equal to zero. So this is the risk or the error, we call it the type one error, the error that you're going to make the wrong decision in saying that it's not zero when in fact it is. So um, now we're going to say compute, uh, compare the R, the third thing that we do is we compare the absolute value of R that we calculate to this critical value that we get from the table. If the absolute value is greater than the critical value that we look up in the table, then R is statistically significant. That means that there does exist sufficient evidence to conclude that a linear relationship between our X variable and our Y variable in our population of whatever it is our population is exists 
at a confidence level of, now here we take 1 minus alpha times 100%, tested with a simple random sample of, and then we put in. So this formula, this sentence, you need to, um, you need to write down and you need to use it in this section when I ask you to um, give me an analysis or give me a conclusion. This is the statement. So I've given you exactly what you need to write. Do that, you'll get it right. Do anything else, you'll get it wrong. Okay. Um, now, if R is less than that critical value from the table, then it is not statistically significant. And everything up here is the same, except for instead of saying does exist, we'll say does not exist. There is not sufficient evidence to conclude that the linear relationship between the x variable and the y variable in this population exists at a confidence level of whatever alpha, 1 minus alpha times 100 is, and tested with this simple random sample. It's important to tell people how many samples you used, because the smaller the sample size, the more volatile the results are, and the larger the sample size, the more stable your results are. Okay, so sorry for the long lecture, but this is a complex topic, and so I wanted to take an extra minute or so. And before we go, um, even though we're not doing it, let's go over to this table and look for n equals 8. That was our example last time. Uh, n equals 8, and we calculated a 0.97. So r was equal to 0.97. And let's say if I'm interested in alpha equals 0.01, is r statistically significant? And we'll do this formally next time. So I'm going to find alpha equals 0.01 up here and go down. And here is my critical value. So my critical value is 0.83. And I'm going to write down, is the absolute value of R greater than my critical value? And so I put the absolute value of R. It's already positive, so 0.97. And then I put this greater than sign, and then I write my critical value, 0.83. If this statement is true, then R is statistically significant. 0.97 is bigger than 0.83, so it is statistically significant. Like I said, next time we'll do a um, formal example of this, the same thing, but I wanted to give you a little bit of uh, exposure to it now. Rem remember to scan your lecture notes before midnight of the date listed on the course calendar. Make them neat so you can read them. Update your formula sheet, and as I mentioned last time, Oops, sorry for that. Uh, you can have definitions of symbols on the formula sheet. If you have questions, come to my virtual office hours. I'm happy to help you. If none of those work, then email me, but make sure you email me a picture of your work and the problem so I can help you faster. We'll see you next time.